Let's move forward in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in that sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Last Sunday, if you will recall, Pastor Greg challenged us to make God the priority of our life. That is, to put God first in everything. He clearly noted five very important truths from the Bible. What would happen if we make God a priority? And one of the truths is expressed in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his Sermon on the Mount, when he talked about worrying about the physical needs that we have, and then he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. That's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But may I ask you, do you really believe these words? I mean, some of us memorize it. But do we really believe these words? And many would say, yes, absolutely, we believe Christ's words. But however, in our daily life, do we really live out the truth of these words? Are we putting these words into practice? When we are confronted with issues that demands our attention, do we seek God first? Or other first? And then let God follow us. I'm afraid many of us would not be able to say positively yes. I know, I know it is hard to, get, to be confronted with the reality that we are in practice denying God of His power. But we must face it. And that's the reason why we study the Bible. For in the Bible, we find God's truth in matters of our faith life. Everything, physical and spiritual. We have the authority in the Word of God. In our study this morning, I will continue the topic of priority. But this time we will touch on how, how priority is practiced or seen in the life of God's people, the Israelites. How many times have you heard a sermon on the book of Haggai? Maybe five years ago. Maybe you haven't read the book of Haggai. So we will learn how the Israelites move from seeking their own pleasure to seeking God's will and purpose. First. You see, the story of Israel during the ministry of Haggai is reflective of the attitude 
opposite of what Jesus Christ taught us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Instead of doing the work of the Lord and the kingdom of God and His righteousness, they were doing their own thing ahead of what God desired for them to do. Now, dealing with Old Testament texts, we need to have a background because we seldom read the text. So as a background, let me give you a, a concise history, and I want you to listen, of Israel before the events recorded in this book. Now, because of unfaithfulness, God sent King Nebuchadnezzar and his armies to destroy Jerusalem and the temple in 586 BC. The people then were exiled to Babylon. That is Iraq, Babylon. You find that recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 15 to 21. When Persia, Iran, under King Cyrus, conquered Babylon, these rights were allowed to return to Jerusalem. And the primary reason for their return is to rebuild the temple that was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar 70 years before. And the first group of exiles to return, approximately 50,000, was led by Zerubbabel. The appointed governor and Joshua, the high priest. And a few months after they had settled in their towns, the people and their leaders began building the altar first. And then two years later, they laid the foundation and started building the temple structure. We find that in Ezra chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. The work was not without problems. For their Samaritan neighbors envied them. It's always the case, right? When we do the work of the Lord, there will always be problems and obstacles and hindrances. Because we are living in a world that is under the control of the enemy. So the Samaritan neighbors discourage, frustrate, and make them afraid. As much of the four, verse 1 to 5. And for six years, the Jews labored rebuilding the temple under this troublesome environment. Eventually, the building project came to a complete halt, stop. Because the king commanded, ordered a decree that the building should be stopped. And it would be another 10 years before the rebuilding resumed. And the question is, what were the Jews doing in that span of years, 10 years. What were they doing in 10 years? And that is the issue addressed by the prophet Haggai. Okay? Now, in our message, we will consider five actions of the Lord, of the Lord Almighty that are in this chapter. And I'll mention them as we go along. The first one is in verse. One to four. Thank you. God confronts his people of their misplaced priority. He confronts them of their misplaced priority. Now, notice that our passage begins with the date of Haggai's message and connects it historically 
and chronologically with the record found in the book of Ezra. Now, Ezra chapter 4 verse 24 records, Then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of the Darius, king of Persia. That's in Ezra 4.24. The first verse of our text speaks up on this. In the second year of King Darius, the king, in the sixth month of the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Now, from the time the rebuilding stopped to the time the word of the Lord came to Haggai spans ten years. What were the Jews doing those years? The question we pose at the beginning. Unfortunately, we are not told. But the Lord, who knows everyone's hearts, confronts them with their distorted priority. And that's something we have to consider about our God. He knows everything. He knows even the words that come out of our mouth before him. Is heard. He knows. He knows what is in our mind. So even though we are not told what the Jews were doing in 10 years, God knows. Because He sees from their attitude and actions the real intent of their hearts. Look at verse 2 and 4. To the four in our text. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Hamad to the people. Is it time for you to yourselves to dwell in your pilot houses while the house lies in ruins? What is God saying? God is saying that his house is in ruins while these people are comfortably living in their own beautiful houses. The temple is neglected and remains unfinished while they busy themselves upgrading and beautifying own houses. Now, to be sure we have a record of the people saying that it is not the right time for them to build the temple. We know that at the beginning of their building project, they were opposed, harassed, and discouraged by their Samaritan neighbors, and even ordered to stop by the government authority. But would that be the reason enough to stop the work of the house of God? Was the presence of the opposition a sign from God to leave the temple and finish for now? Should, should we assume that because of the opposition, these Jews may be thinking, yeah, it is not your time for the house of God to build. Maybe they may be saying to themselves, to one another, you know what? The best thing for us is to wait until the hindrance is removed before proceeding with the rebuilding. Wouldn't that be more logical? Wait, yeah, let's just wait until the opposition stop then will start the building. But is doing 
the will of God means free from hindrances and opposition. No. If we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and on the process encounter hardship and obstacles, are we to conclude that we are out of step with God's timing? No. If this is true, then the Apostle Paul's missionary work towards the Gentiles would have continued. He would have stopped preaching the gospel because opposition and dangers awaited him in every city that he visited. But he didn't stop. He didn't stop proclaiming the gospel. Why? Because for the Apostle Paul, preaching Christ crucified was his priority. You see? If the Jews' priority in returning to Jerusalem is to build the temple, how could they invent it and finish? So how did the Apostle Paul overcome the opposition? Not I, but through Christ in me. For it is He, that is God, who works in us to will and to work for His good pleasure. Such will be His answer. God is telling the Israelites, your attitude is not right. How can you say that it is the time to rebuild the house of God, but the right time to build and beautify your own houses? How can you live so comfortably in your own homes, disregarding my house, which is in ruins? Where is your sense of priority? Now remember that the temple is not just the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, it's not just a building, it is a symbol of God's presence among his people. And that's how important it is. God is saying, Am I not worth your time in that? And these questions may well be directed to us, do you think so? Because our attitude towards the will of God runs parallel to that of the Jews of Hawaii's day. We believe that God has the right to claim first place in our life, but when it comes to our daily actions and attitudes, He's the last person in our list. Now we, we learn from the example of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was praying before the cross, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will but thine be done. We say it differently. Not your will but mine be done. The Lord doesn't have the last words in our decisions and conversations. We have the last word. The Lord doesn't get the praise in our successes and thanks in our accomplishments. We get them. The Lord doesn't receive our worship in our spiritual victories. We do. And like the Jews, when we face the task that challenges our faith in His power, we shrink back and say, Ah, the time has not yet come for me to get involved.
may this not happen to us. Those I think about God's words of accusation against the Jews, I ask myself, for 10 years, has no one reminded them of God's house that is in the world? Probably many of them pass by the building, which is still unfinished. And no one even had the guts to say how pitiful the building. Can we do anything about the building? Has no one reminded them that for 10 years the house of the Lord is still unfinished? No one. But there's one God. God Himself has been reminding them for 10 years. Where is that? That's our second action of the Lord. God calls His people to consider their grace. In other words, He is asking them to give careful thought to what's going on in their lives. To what's going on in their lives. Look at verse 5 and 6. Look at verse 5 and 6. Now therefore, that says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into bag with holes. In these verses, God is trying to get their attention to the many unlikely things happening in their lives. As if God is saying, don't you see it, people? Have you ever wondered why your efforts in farming produces little crops? Your much eating and drinking do not satisfy. Your new designer clothes provide little comfort and you take home pay. Don't flush down in your pockets. Did you ever pause to ask, why is this happening? I have done all I can to provide for my family, yet we are not satisfied and fulfilled. How about you so that is something wrong? But why can they discern the hand of the Lord at work? through these natural things? Why? What made them so insensitive to what the Lord is doing? It is because they are not in right fellowship with God. They are not in right fellowship with God. In the words of the Apostle Paul, they are not walking in the Spirit. They are living a life of disobedience, denying the Lord of His rightful place. You see, if you are out of fellowship with the Lord because of sin, you won't be able to discern what He is doing in your life to accomplish His will and purpose. You will discern His warning. You will discern His instruction and His guidance which would lead you to a life that pleases Him. Why? 
Because sin numbs us, blinds us to God's activities, to things that are eternally significant. That's why the Apostle Paul says that each day we have to offer ourselves to God as living sacrifices. Why? Because the pull of the world is strong. We have to offer ourselves to God and let Him work in our lives. Not allowing ourselves to copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let Him transform us into a new person by changing the way we think. Then we will know what God wants us to do and we will know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. And so because the people fail to acknowledge the preeminence of God in their lives, their labor remains all their efforts in providing for their physical needs offer no real contentment and satisfaction. But what does the preeminence of the supremacy of God have to do with the quality of life that I'm living? Everything. Because God owns the world and all that He lives in. He controls nature. He controls everything. And what he wills is for his glory and for our own good. So if we go against God, then we are against the one who controls everything. So God says to these Jews in verses 9 to 11, and he clarifies the consequences of their disobedience. And he's saying to them, you know what? Because you've been doing this for 10 years. This is what happened to you. You look for much, and behold, it came little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Because the Lord of us, because my house that lies in the woods, when each of you busy himself, is your own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the Jew, and the earth has withheld its reduce. And I have called for a drought on the land and on the hills, on the grain, the new harvest, the oil, and on the broad winds forth on man and beast. And all the labor. God controls everything. And in these verses, he explains what he could, what the, the Jews could not comprehend in verses 5 and 6. You know, they have known earlier that God is supreme over all the affairs of his creation. They could have avoided this pleasing the world. If all things were created through Him and for Him, and that He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together, surely He must be supreme in everything. And if we acknowledge Him as such, then for sure. Nothing would be amiss. Clearly, the problem of the Israelites is misplaced priority. Because of their disobedience, they fail to recognize that God controls everything. They have focused so much on everyday mundane things, horizontal things. 
that they can discern the vertical. While they concentrate on building and beautifying their own houses, God's blessings in them are being withheld because they put the Lord at the bottom of their priority. And by neglecting God's house, they show contempt and disregard for His honor and authority. By forgetting the reason for their return from captivity as laid down by God, they undermine His good purpose and is perfect will. The same is true with us who are believers. We have been saved from the wrath of God, not because we deserve to be saved, but because of God's great love and mercy toward us. For what purpose? In the words of the Apostle Paul, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted or glorified in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, says Paul, to live is the world, to live is my possession, to live is my profession to live is my family? No. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. You see, the most God created and redeemed us for Himself. And we find no rest until we find ourselves in Him. That's why the song, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. Why? So that the things of this world will grow strangely deep in the light of His glory. Paul, in writing to the believers in Corinthians, talking about we believers being ambassadors for Christ, says, For Christ's love compels us. It is not our love for Christ. It is not our love for Christ that compels us to get involved in the work of Christ. No. It is Christ's love for us. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that no one died for all, and therefore, and therefore all died. And he, that is Christ, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. And as Christians, we live not for ourselves. We live not for ourselves, but for Christ. And the challenge of the truth that God is supreme comes when we apply this to our personal and family life. Our relationship, our work, our school, our church, our ministry, everything. Is the love of Christ compelling us? Is He at the very heart of all of these things? Taking control, directing our action, and getting the glory. Back to the Jews. Now that they have heard from God, What are they to do? What are they to do? And that's a big question. Lick their wounds and wait for God's 
punishment? No. God is too kind to do that. God is gracious and merciful, and his next move was not condemnation. He didn't say to them, you Jews, I'm going to get you. Because of what, what you are doing to me, I'm going to get you. No. He comes from them. That's the fourth option. God counsels his people to restore the buildings in the temple. God is saying to them, come on, build the temple. This is what you're going to do. Verse 7 and 8, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Now look at the verse very carefully. It is interesting that the Lord does not tell them to obey so that he may bless and prosper them. So that he may bless and prosper them, although God can do it if he desires to do so. No, God tells them that if they obey and build his house, he will be pleased and not hurt. Now we have just discussed and mentioned the consequences of their disobedience. They were discontented, discontentment, emptiness, and they are fruitful labor. So we expect that their obedience would move God to bring prosperity and we love it, right? In other words, what we often think is that I obey God because he will do this to me. As if God is just a, a vending machine, you put in a coin, and then comes coke. Right? It's not like that. God is the God of the universe. He can do anything. And everything that God does is for his glory and for our good. But why then did God not promise them prosperity in return for their obedience? For sure they were really maybe anticipating that God would prosper them. But no, it was not at the very beginning, it was not God's purpose for them. And many Christians think this is God's normal way of dealing with his people, right? But this is not necessary, true? Because many saints in the Bible died faithful and obedient without becoming prosperous. But I believe God does not want them to obey him in order to get something in return, but simply to glorify Him. Remember the words of the Lord? Seek first His kingdom, His righteousness. That is His. We glorify Him first. Then the next phrase, all these things will be added unto us to see. And then God will eventually give his blessing. Sometimes our, our minds is that we do it the opposite way. Right? And that's a problem. Shouldn't this be the right and primary motive for obeying God? Glorify him. Shouldn't this be the right and primary reason for giving God our best? Isn't this what the Bible is teaching us? Of course it is. Even in the most mundane and ordinary sinless activity as believers, we have to glorify God. Because Paul says, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. If you're 
looking in the shop, you do it all for the Lord. If you are shopping, you do it all for the Lord. In other words, with God's strength and for God's glory and for God's purposes. Why is this Paul? Why is this that, that everything for God's glory? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. But obeying God may not come easy. Because the Jews building a house of God not only demand courage to face the anger, the hatred, the threats of their Samaritan neighbors, but also physical strength, hard work, and commitment to carry out the building proper. And to go up the mountain and bringing down southern trees is hard labor. And they must trust God. They must trust God for wisdom, for protection, and encouragement. But could they trust God? I mean, for 10 years, they haven't trusted God. They haven't trusted God. But could they trust God now? How would they respond to God's call? That's the last. God causes His people to obey His words. Now, I emphasize, I emphasize the, the fact that it is God who causes us to obey Him. It is not me. It is not my own mission. It is not my own willpower to pay, no. It is God who causes us to obey His word. Now, at this point in the narrative, the Jews must come to a decision. In some point in our lives, we have, we have to come to a decision. Would we obey God? Or would we follow God? our own selfish desire. But some of the Jews may argue, but God, what about the opposition? What about the prohibition that to rebuild the house of God? How can we overcome such obstacles? And maybe some, some of you may have the same argument. How about the hardship, Lord? How can we all come? We can't obey you because of these things, because of these things. Then comes the word of the Lord. Verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. Four words. I am with you. I am with you. Just the right words to a repentant, fearful, discouraged. What God is saying is, hey guys, I am on your side. I mean, if you are playing basketball, if we are LeBron James and the round with us, we can be pretty sure to win, right? Here we have God saying, hey guys, you're discouraged? About the opposition? About these obstacles? Hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. These, are, these words, more than ever, are words more comforting and encouraging than all other words could ever hear from God. They are not words for the Jews only, but for those of us who are discouraged. To some discouraged and mournful for their sin because they have displeased God with their willful disobedience. For others discouraged because of the many struggles and trials in life that seem insurmountable. Whatever your discouragement may be, 
with the Lord on your side, we can say with the Apostle Paul that we are more than If God is for us, who can be against us? That's a great encouragement. But, but God didn't stop there. He also stirred up their spirits. Verse 14. In other words, God inspires, stimulates, energizes them by imparting power to their weakened spirit. Left to ourselves and apart from the Spirit of God, no one is able to obey God and do His will. That's why the prophet says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We can do it. We can. Even with all our knowledge of Scripture, apart from the Spirit of God, we cannot obey His will. Why? Words of Jesus Christ. I am the value of the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And as a result of the work of the Lord in their hearts, a great transformation you know, even though we are Christians, every day there must be a transformation. Because we are still growing. And this spiritual, spiritually insensitive, disobedient, and priority distorting people of God, in verse 12, says, they obey the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, and the people feared or reverence the Lord. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, the Lord, on the twenty-fourth day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of the rise. That, that seemed to be like, and they live happily ever after. They will be God. And here's the thing. When we acknowledge God for who He is, the Lord Almighty, when we consider Jesus Christ and His work on the cross for our salvation, nothing but the best is what we give Him and nothing but first place is what we ascribe to him. And this is summed up in the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. We no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised again. But you may ask to yourself, Pastor Glenn, okay, I need to request, what is there for me? It's always the case, what is there for me? Hey, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. He saved you. That's the biggest thing. Is he not capable? To bless you until we reach the He knows everything. He is all power. I want such a God. Unless 
will ponder before him and acknowledge his claim on us. We can never wise in plenty of victory. Our Father, we acknowledge that we are sinful, we are weak, we can never appreciate the way you intend for us to do. But we have your Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And he is able to do exceeding abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. Remind us of having your Father. of our own weaknesses so that we may put ourselves under your authority and claim your power. That's all the way. Father, I pray that for those of us in here who are discouraged and even struggling because of life's difficulties. May that your spirit be in us and working in us. We have his way. Not only encouraging, but also strengthening us. So that we may rise up above our troubles and our hardships and say to the Lord, yeah, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. May this be the confidence of our life that we have God, not only who knows everything, but who is awesome, powerful, to change everything. For his honor, for his glory, for your praise, Jesus' name.